Okay, let's get started. So, um, welcome everyone to this fantastic session. Uh, my name is David Phillips. I'm the president and COO of Enlogic, a company based in, in Canada that uh, uses data and analytics to help forecasters make sense of their data and how agencies do the same. And uh, I'm not going to, I have a great panel and uh, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves shortly. I would give a piece of advice to my panelists that we should take advantage of being uh, remote. And I think one of the things that we don't see enough of is if you don't want a question answered, you can just duck out of the screen. <laughs> so if, if I see if I see no one actually on the screen, I know I need to move to the next question. So take advantage of the fact that we are remote and, and I can't do anything if you actually just either unplug yourself or walk away, which doesn't typically happen in a face to face one. So this is a bit of an unusual situation. I've not done a remote panel before. I don't know if you guys, you're probably esteemed, so you probably have done these before, but let's try and keep it um, light. Let's try and um, participate as much as possible. And um, I think we've got a lot to get stuck into and some great different perspectives to uh, to offer today. So without further ado, why don't I um, ask you, I'm gonna ask you guys to quickly introduce yourselves. And at the same time, after you've introduced yourself, if you could give a quick, overview of what you think of the broad question the broad question being the road to holistic tv planning and reporting so what what does it take where are we whatever you think your first perspective is on that and then we can get stuck into a few more questions so why don't we start with who's looking hurt and keen steve hi everyone uh, my name is steve martin i'm a managing director in live ramps international business which basically means everything outside of the usa and i'm looking after bringing our tv proposition to europe so i've got a very strong interest in, in this area i think for me in terms of the, the world that we live in um, the concept of holistic tv and the road to it i think that road definitely runs through um, your individual level work so whether that's targeting or measurement i think the holistic um, you know tv buying and measurement has to run through the individual and i think the other piece which i feel really strongly about is that it has to come back to business outcomes um, so new customers new sales whatever it might be but i think you know the world you know the road the road to holistic tv has to get all the way back to business outcomes Excellent, thank you. We'll get to that later for sure. Um, Emma, how about you next? Hello, uh, I'm Emma Moorhead and I'm general manager in the media team at Wavemaker. Um, and uh, when we think about holistic planning for me, I, it's um, something that is really, really fundamental to how we approach uh, TV planning. Um, so, so we tend to do this with an audience first approach and, and ensuring that we have a holistic approach means that we can make better decisions about when, um, where and how we talk to the consumer. Um, it's a journey that, you know, we, we, it's an approach or a journey that we started um, or have always used almost, um, but it's been faced with lots of different challenges, lots of challenges around measurement and the reporting side of things, lots of technical um, difficulties and being able to be truly holistic. Um, but that's something that we've been supporting our clients in, in trying to achieve. And it's how we set ourselves up as an agency and, and it is how we talk to, to our clients, because I think it, it is the kind of the most important thing in terms of making sure that we d do deliver on those outcomes as we've just mentioned. Great, thank you. And uh, Sarah, by the way, you, you're appearing in my lineup as, in a very British way. You have Jones Sarah, which sounds like you're oh, being... that's a sky thing. Right, okay. <laughs> very kind of like you know uh calling the register jones sarah <laughs> so uh sarah if you uh if you could go next yeah so i'm um, jane sarah from sky media <laughs> um, so i am director of planning at sky media um previously to sky i spent the rest of my career in agency life so most recently at mediacom um so i guess i could probably answer this question with two different hats on my my old agency hat would say that been trying to get to a kind of holistic way of planning for a long time, particularly in the TV world, as audiences have increasingly fragmented across platforms. It's just got harder and harder to be able to track and measure where they're watching and therefore what kind of reach you can generate against that particular audience. Um, so, so I guess, you know, from an industry point of view, it's been something that, that we've been very keen to deliver for clients. 
and then from a Sky perspective, you know, as a broadcaster, we've been one of the things that's contributed to that fragmentation in TV. You know, we kind of make our TV content available to people wherever they want to watch it, um, and inevitably that throws up a measurement challenge. Um, and from a Sky point of view, we've been quite lucky. We kind of following the acquisition of, from Comcast, working with NBCU last year, um, we now have SeaFlight, which is a cross-platform measurement tool um, that uses a benefit of, you know, Sky as we've got a massive customer base and a panel of 500,000 people that gives us really, really accurate understanding of what they're watching on TV and how they're watching TV across platforms. So SeaFlight eventually, essentially just deduplicates that reach across TV and um, linear and VOD um, and can give an advertiser a, a really um, clear view of what that reach might be. So we're right in it at Sky, I guess, and you know, Sea Flight is something that we're uh, working with ITV and Channel Four on as well. Um, kind of following that, we we've got an initiative at Sky that's called One Campaign, which is about kind of packaging up TV and and VOD as as one cell. So it ultimately becomes one campaign that people buy from us, and will allow us to um, you know basically help advertisers reach the audience wherever they're watching. So I just say, and like I say this because I don't have business in the UK. Sky is really irritating because everyone else across the world is like, "Why can't you do what Sky is doing?" It's like because it's Sky. <laughs> so like, thank you for that. That's useful. But thank you for also raising the expectations of my clients of what they can achieve. To no problem. So I appreciate that, James. Sarah. You're so um, Mike. Hi, uh, David. So I'm Mike Shaw. I lead uh, Roku's ad sales team uh, in the UK. I joined Roku very recently through the acquisition of DataZoo, a uh, demand side platform uh, to bulk out uh, the Roku ad offering. The question's a really interesting one, this road to holistic TV planning, and I think we're a lot nearer the start of it than the end of it. Um, I think there's a, there's a huge amount to do, but actually just linking back to uh, to Sarah, Joan, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah's answer. Um, I think one of the really interesting parts about the new world of TV that we're moving into um, and, and the trait that's going to be more interesting uh, and important for us to go forward is this idea of flexibility. So Sky is an incredibly good example of, uh, of an innovative company who are, um, who are actually developing something very pragmatic on the road to uh, planning, measurement and this whole holistic TV idea through SeaFlight, whilst actually not throwing this incredible asset, um, Barb, out, out the window. They're very committed uh, work with Barb uh, still, and that has a huge value in the marketplace. Uh, and also, whilst being a uh, whilst being a media owner itself, uh, Sky is also being very collaborative in having this open platform and collaborating with what had been hitherto competitive broadcasters in order to ensure that the television as a as a media. Uh, succeeds and thrives as it has done previously. It's one of the best brand building uh, opportunities that exist and, and that requirement for brand building and working with consumers doesn't change just because media is fragmenting. So despite the fact that there is all this change, there's all this technological possibility out there, we can't forget the fundamental tenants and actually kind of sticking together as an industry and ensuring that uh, we continue to get the, the right amount of media budget for this amazing engagement and experiences delivered to consumers is going to be key. I think we've basically covered everything. So I, <laughs> we I did, we're done. My, my, uh, <laughs> that was about uh, 12 minutes. Yeah, I think Kat thinks that's, we should keep going, but um, <laughs> that was excellent. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to ask a really dumb question that I didn't ask of you ahead of time, and it seems really dumb, but I think it may be, there may be some interesting answers. We'll see. Why? And the question is like, okay, so we had, we've got, we've had different descriptions of what sort of we are, where we are on the road, and what's important, and what this means to people. Um, why do we care? Like, why is it important? It's particularly, I think I'm, I'm thinking and looking now at Emma. What, why do we care about having a holistic view of TV? After all, you know, whenever you're doing a plan, you're not, you're looking at multiple sources, you're looking at multiple media, you're looking at whatever. So media, to your point, media agencies have always, you know, looked across a spread of different distribution channels and media entities and put things together that make sense for their client. Why do we get particularly fixated, and why should we be particularly fixated on the idea of bringing wrapping all TV and all video together? Um, wow, well, that's a, that's a big question. Sorry, question. I didn't prep you for that. At all. <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> um, I'm right. I think it's I think it's important 
um, primarily because we need to make sure that we're making the right decisions about where we're recommending our clients should be investing their budgets. Um, and I think in order to do that, we need to be taking this holistic approach and uh, ensuring that we look at all possible opportunities for reaching um, our target audience. Um, and that and that becomes particularly important when we think about um, what TV is, um, because it's, um, you know, it, it encompasses, it has the potential to encompass lots of different forms um, and how they're measured um, can look very different. And so we need to make sure that we are um, comparing all possible opportunities on a like-for-like um, -like basis in order to then make the right decision about um, what's best for a particular campaign for, to reach a particular audience given a particular set of objectives. Um, so it, it, if you look at it from the opposite um, kind of end of the spectrum where you're, you're not um, taking a, a holistic approach, um, you run the risk of... Um, of missing potential audiences um, and missing potential opportunities to de to deliver the best outcome. Um, and part of the, the challenge that we have is that um, not all the opportunities are being compared in a like for like manner. Um, and that, and that I, I suppose, is the, the biggest uh, challenge. Um, so you're sort of aware of gaps and those are frustrating. So how do you yeah that's a difficult thing to, to be sort of part of i guess yeah and so um you know going, going back to my previous point about what is tv i mean that in itself is a particularly challenging question because um you know we have at one end of the spectrum kind of high production value um long form content and then at the other ha uh, end of the spectrum you've kind of got ugc short form you know um content and does does that still count as tv and if and if we're saying that it does then how are we measuring um um viewing uh, across all the the different opportunities um and and how are we deciding where where is best to invest our, our clients money um you know that that's why i think it's important to have an approach that encompasses all pos possible opportunities and try and benchmark those in a like-for-like -like manner um and does anyone else have any, I've got a question, a follow-on question to that, but does anyone have, else have any comments on, on why you think we should bother with this? I think we care from a broadcast TV perspective because a lot of the narrative has been around the decline of TV and people not watching TV anymore, but actually people are just watching TV content in different ways. Um, and, you know, where there is kind of, you know, there's quite a lot of unmatched viewing coming in from uh, Netflix, for example, but that's over and above the kind of broadcast TV commercial hours that people are watching. So by just bringing the platforms together under one holistic view, it just enables us to, to justify the value of TV as a, you know, consistently proves to be a really strong way to reach millions of people um, in the market. Excellent. Anyone else have anything else to add on that? Before we do? I'd just say that I think it, this is where TV does have to do the hard yards because otherwise the, the money moves to the past of least, res, uh, least resistance, which is um, the bigger platforms that appear to be doing something similar in terms of reach, if not uh, certainly results. But actually, it's very, very different and you won't know it until the long term. There's a, the great work by Binet and Field on the long and short of it and, and really the value of where television comes in. Uh, we won't know what we've lost until it's gone unless the TV industry really does a good job of this part now. And um, to Sarah's point beforehand, you know, there was lots of talk about this. This TV uh, is, you know, wh where is it going? It's dropping. And, and our view is very much like TV isn't going anywhere. It's going everywhere. And the, the data that came out, uh, Ofcom looked at it from the start of the COVID period in the UK. Yes, there was a big rise in unmatched bar viewing as people were streaming a lot more going into subscription board services. But actually, there was an equal, almost to the minute, rise in match viewing on linear television uh, output. So you've got this uh, incredibly compelling uh, medium that consumers aren't, they're just changing the way they're doing it. If anything, they're interacting with it more. And it's very much our job as an industry to make sure that gets protected by putting in place the right systems that can allow buyers to, to see what they're getting and monitor the value of that. 
So, um, speaking as a parent of an eight-year-old and a ten-year-old boy, uh, my uh, our match standard match viewing has gone up exponentially because there's no way I'm going to look after my kids for that long because um, <laughs> they're annoying. Um, where do you think? And I want to bring Steve in because we haven't, we haven't uh, heard from you yet, Steve. Where do you think TV has has taken good steps, and what are the steps that it should be taking that it hasn't yet? I think, you know, even just listening to the conversation, you know, just now, I think where TV's taken some really good steps is realizing that the true competition is not necessarily other people in TV. Um, and therefore, I think there's been some really good steps around, you know, how do we collaborate within the TV industry, um, you know, to fix this. So I think that to me is a really positive, you know, step forward. I think, you know, all, you know, the, you know, the road to all problem solving starts with self-awareness. And I think the getting to that right I think the piece that I still sort of worry a bit about you know looking in and I guess you know from the perspective of live ramp we work across you know both digital and tv so I often end up doing a bit of a compare and contrast I worry that a lot of the technology that is now beginning to be available in tv you know, isn't really being used to its potential so you have technology that can offer you know, data-driven, you know, uh, targeting, data-driven measurement. And really, a lot of the time, I see it being used purely for kind of reach extension or whatever it might be. And that, to me, seems like a, you know, a massive missed opportunity to actually, even if it is on relatively limited scale, we've got to get advertisers to buy into the fact that this is a better way forward. It's not about enhancing linear per se. It's about actually doing something different and better and that this is what's going to grow and actually the advertisers that, that do the learning now are going to be the ones that are well placed you know as it grows so to me that's the that's the piece i'd like to see go further and quicker you know we've been to lots of these conferences where we agree on a sort of direction and even sometimes an objective we need to get to a total picture of t a picture of total tv and and it progress although there is progress can be difficult and can be halting depending on the country and depending on the situation we're in um, and some of that, you know, and Steve touched on the issue of technology. Some of that is technology. Some of it is paradigm. Some of it is politics. Some of it, there's lots of different things. And I want to dig into some of these areas now. But first, what I want to get your take on is what are some of the barriers in this area of getting to holistic, uh, holistic TV that tend to get overlooked or underestimated? So, for example, one of the things we, we see is these systems that are often within broadcasters and within agencies are built on a certain way of doing things. So they're built, for example, on a certain way of trading. Mm -hmm. and so moving to the sort of approach that Steve suggested that we say we want to move to isn't as simple as just all agreeing to do something. It is also how does that impact systems? And that, so that's, that's an area we think sometimes gets overlooked. In your opinion, what are some of those areas that we tend to underestimate when it comes to making this change and making progress down this road? Let's start with Steve. Okay. Um, I think for me, maybe we need to, you know, if we were looking at within an organization, a single organization as a problem, I think we'd very quickly see it as a change management problem rather than a technology problem. And I think that's really hard to do at an industry level. But the biggest problem here is, in my mind, is human beings having habits and habits are really hard to break. And you know that there's a, you know there's a huge amount of you know, resources and learning out there about how to do successful change management. Somehow, as an industry, we almost need to you know implement a sort of change management pro process. So I think you know clearly some of that's a bit aspirational, but I think you know boiling down, I bring back to the fact that let's think about the human beings here rather than just the tech. And you know how do we create change with the humans? Um, so I think. Tech, can be there. I think the data can be there. But until we actually get the people in the industry thinking and acting differently, you won't get the change. And that would be the same change management problem. So I think maybe a bit more focus on, on people would, would help us. So Sarah, you, you've been on sort of both sides of this and, and you've, you know, been in companies probably at different stages of evolution in terms of change management from a personal point of view and from a tech point of view. What's your take on this? Like, what's your take on what tends to get overlooked when we try and move things forward? Uh, so, I mean, I agree with Steve. A lot of it's legacy. You know, TV's probably got the longest legacy from a media buying perspective. 
out there and inevitably that long legacy is is very hard to change i think from i mean from personal experience on on this side of the fence on the sales side i think um agreeing what the standard metric might be there's a huge amount of debate around that um you know and and, and for good reason i think there are you know tv's always been has been dealt in in impression in impacts and ratings and you know from a digital point of view you have the world of impressions and i think you know that it, it makes sense to unify and you know from a CFI point of view we we bring everything under the impressions umbrella um but i think the risk with that inevitably is that it it kind of then looks like all impressions are equal well, when actually they're not yeah, yeah yeah and so so i think you know there's there's a difference between a tv and vod impression and a facebook impression and and i think we we will we're going to have to get to a point where everybody still can to recognize that because what we don't want is for people to um you know, to strip out all of the trust and attention and emotional engagement and everything else that comes with the world of TV and and look at that in a like for like basis with with some of the digital channels that are out there. Um, but as I said, I think, you know, a standard, there has to be a standard metric um, and impressions is one that, you know, everybody understands as a, you know, one hit of one person in one place, is, you know, feels relatively straightforward. Um, so I think that that's been an issue. And then, I mean, I guess from a Sky point of view, um, as I said, we've had, you know, having a tool that can do this job. Um, you can demonstrate and take time. out and actually go yeah, here. Exactly. Like. You know, that, that actually, you know, creates graphs and reports and all, all that type of stuff. Um, is a big job and you know because of the relationship with NBC year a lot of that that work has been done for us in advance but there's still a huge amount of work to be done and from a UK perspective um, you know the the kind of the click a button and it creates a report is still a couple of months out I think you know we're in a position now where we can pull all the data together and our insight team can work out those numbers from de you know deduplicating all the data that we have um, but it isn't quite yet at the, you know, at the click of a button, which is where you want it to be in order to be able to do it at absolute scale. So that, that's all excellent stuff. And I'm going to now begin to put Emma under a bit of pressure. And like Mike, I want to get to it at some point because I know I haven't talked to you for a bit. But um, what's interesting here is is we talked a little bit about sort of some of the issues in, in terms of getting to change. But what we haven't really touched on yet is who can make those changes? Because something I see quite a lot is Agencies will be like, or brands say we want to see a total picture. Agencies will sort of say they want that. Certainly the planners will want that. Sometimes what the buyers want is, you know what, I've got my spreadsheet that I've filled in for the last 20 years. I have a number in it that's driven by a procurement contract that I have with my advertiser. So my job isn't actually to plan TV to that holistic view. It's to put a number in the spreadsheet because that's what my procurement contract calls for. So sometimes it's it's there may be a desire to move to something, but there's kind of paradigms underneath it, even sometimes like the, the contracts the agencies have with their brands work almost like in opposition to that. So whose responsibility is it, Emma, do you think to really drive this? Is it solely with the broadcasters? Is it like, how does this work? No, this needs to be something that is everybody's responsibility. And I think there's lots of different things at play here. So TV, has a legacy of working. We know that it works. And to that effect, it's almost become a bit complacent over the years and it hasn't needed to be as collaborative as we're now seeing the TV industry become. Um, but it also means that it's kind of, um, the, the, the pounds have, have naturally always gone towards the, the TV industry. That, um, that has started to change. There are new entrants in the market, be that subscription VOD um, platforms, be that the Amazons, the Facebooks, the, the Googles and YouTubes of this world, um, which now mean that that um, the, the TV broadcasters themselves can't afford to be quite so complacent. Then there's obviously the agency situation where we um, are, are, are paid to um, help our clients um, sell their brands, sell their products. Um, and in order to do that, we need to be pushing that agenda too. And that's absolutely something that uh, a wave maker we have been doing. And we've been talking about this for a long time. And, and, um, and Sarah made the point um, earlier about 
about uh, the fact that not all in impacts are equal. This is a conversation that we have been having with our clients for quite some time in order to make sure that they understand how we're investing their 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 money. Um, but at the same at the same time, I think it's absolutely uh, um, our clients' responsibility to also make sure that that they're pushing the agenda um, because ultimately going back to where I began, TV works and this is what's supporting their brands and we need to continue um, to see the success of the medium on, on behalf of advertisers as much as for consumers. And we know consumers have the appetite to view content, but they also have an appetite to, to pay to view content, which means that we run the risk of not having platforms where clients can advertise. So right. it's also very much in, a, in clients' interest to make sure that they're pushing this agenda. Um, so, so it's it's sort of it, it needs to be everybody together for the greater good of a medium that, from the consumer perspective, is something we still very much um, uh, cherish. And and you know we can see during lockdown the, the the viewing figures have been phenomenal. Everyone wants to view TV, be that live uh, um, or, or um, on demand. Um, but we also need to make sure that it's a, a, in a form which allows advertisers to advertise because um it is so effective and um you know so so, so to your point it, it's it's really everybody has a part to play in that um but uh but but it, it but it is difficult and and some of those difficulties are as you mentioned kind of some of the trading mechanics that that we operate in and um you know they're bought they're they're kind of um uh, steeped in years of kind of legacy uh, uh, agreements and you know fighting for center breaks and positioning breaks on linear tv is you know ha how you know tv departments are set up and we do that on be behalf of our clients to make sure they get the best airtime. but you know are those metrics still valuable in the in this in the world that we operate in now um, you know, it, it's changed. It's changed a lot. Um, and and kind of to Steve's point about people, um, you know, you've got you've got TV um, buyers who are excellent negotiators who are on the phone to Sky day in day out. Um, you know, negotiating airtime, getting you know the best the best programming um, possible, and, and that's one skill set. But at the other end of the spectrum, you now have the ability to to kind of buy really nuanced audiences right, through addressable right. TV, and there's loads more data about how campaigns are performing, and it's much more digital format, and that requires a completely different skill set. And so, you know, it's our job as an agency to make sure that our people can do both the negotiation side of things, but also have the digital skills to be able to kind of um, build campaigns that that work hard for our clients. I think we need Steve to come in and do uh, an industry-wide change management workshop. But <laughs> it's some tough love. He says, okay, look, people, here's what we've got to do. And uh, can I just say also, I appreciate the fact that no one's actually yet ducked out of the camera, because I know you have. <laughs> and I noticed that Sarah was very tactful when she was talking about people negotiating with Sky all the time. She was very, no, no change to the expression. I thought it was going to be like, like a sigh or a roll of the eyes, whatever, nothing. <laughs> So, Mike, you're, you're, um, we talked about, that was excellent, Emma, thank you, that we, we talked about the fact that, you know, there's obviously the evolution of the industry continues and the definition of what the industry is continues to change as well. So, and, and as Roku, I guess you would be a somewhat new entrant, if you like, into, into what we could define as the industry. So, from a sort of inside out perspective, so someone who's relatively new to the industry, but now sort of considered, I would guess, part of the kind of broader picture of the industry, what's your take on... I don't want to say sort of uh, idealism versus um, cynicism, but like, you know, the ideal view is that we all work together and it's all great <clears throat> and everyone adopts sea flight or they adopt whatever. And then we all have a kind of total view of stuff. The more cynical view viewpoint is like, well, ITV built something else. And yes, we have open AP in the US, but we have not everyone's on open AP. So there's always money and politics involved uh, everywhere. H how do you balance from your perspective? How do we balance that? If we don't work together, a house divided against itself falls. And yet, we're not in the business of making money for the industry. We're making we're in the business of making money for ourselves. So how do you? It's a very difficult question. But how how do you balance that? How, what's your perspective on that? So it is a really interesting question, and I think um, 
necessarily perspectives will differ and Roku as you say is a is a new entrant to the market I mean as a uh, as a US proposition as a streaming platform it's uh, 11 years old now but as a uh, essentially as, as uh, a UK media uh, entrant it's about four months old um, uh, and we launched a, a channel based on an understanding of the way people searched on our platform they were looking for free content and because so much of the things on the platform are actually around um, subscription VOD uh, this is why the Roku channel was born kind of two three years ago in the US now in Canada now here I think the perspective uh, from that point is therefore that um, if you've got a very small market share, irrespective of how quickly you're growing, you're all up for collaboration because actually this idea that the rising tide lifts all boats, yours is going to rise uh, a lot faster. If I'm ITV or I'm Sky or I'm Channel 4 and I have a far larger share of a, um, you know, in terms of the, let's call it the traditional television ad market in the UK, it's kind of plateaued, maybe dropped a little bit. It's about the new formats and how much of a share those BVOD offerings can now kind of take that will really define your willingness to be very collaborative or your willingness to own something yourself and do your own thing. Um, and I think it's a very timely question because um, we talked about some of the, the Sky campaigns. I mean, just going back to that last question, I think the one campaign thing is incredibly interesting from within Sky. And if I think to, to Emma's point about the skill set you have as an agency, there'll be this whole new skill set of how you work with this new Sky, where you're not sitting there going, well, I buy this on their TV slots and then I take this out of advance and I do this through AdSmart and then I do this through sponsorships. There's actually a new way of working with Sky, an amazing huge scale, you know, massive reach, lots of opportunities and formats media owner. And that's a skill set in and of itself that is only embryonic because this whole offering has only existed for a very short space of time. In the in the world of this sort of go it alone, collaborate world, Sky doing one thing with one campaign, uh, Planet V will come out from ITV, which will be a new platform which has got ITV, to Jeff Eel's point, ITV plumbing at the heart of it. There may be other broadcasts, etc. in there, but actually ITV is the... Um, the kind of the, the source of truth. It'll be ITV data that powers the start of, of that work and doubtless a lot of it will be ITV hub inventory. Um, Roku is an embryonic uh, player. We have a Roku ad ID, essentially our identifier. Um, and with Steve on the line, I actually think the biggest battleground or area for collaboration is going to be what data is the source of truth in terms of reporting, in terms of planning and in terms of overall measurement of outcomes. Um, that works for the TV industry in future. We've had Barb for years as the currency predominantly around planning for how planning worked and what the outputs of that planning actually led to. We're now moving to a world where actually TV can do so much more. Like part of the question for the panel is we can bring more money into television because it doesn't just have to be about branding anymore. I mean, to my mind, kind of ad smart really started this revolution in terms of taking TV's ability further down the funnel of more targeting at a pretty good scale. And now actually by being able to um, target through addressable TV, but also now tie third party data sets to individual household level work. So we, we've just done some work in the US with Kroger of now being able to link household TV advertising to a massive multi-category retailers shopping data. And so we can start to see um, people able to use TV to build brands, um, to prompt consumers as they're on that purchase journey, because consumer purchase journeys don't last just a digital session or they don't just last a TV ad break. You've got to have ways of tying all this together. And I think um, and they can go all the way down now to, to actually monitoring the output in terms of hard uh, cash at tills. So I think TV's got this amazing opportunity, but it's going to have to either take a point of saying we, we agree to use X probably an independent identification source at the heart of all of these, or we're all going to try and do our own thing with our own registered databases. GDPR makes this quite hard, and I think therefore that the optimal solution will be a an industry agreed, independent, you know, uh, uh, identity only player at the heart of what we do. That is, you do a far better job of this than I do. So I think next time, <laughs> TV advertisers panel should be like, so Mike, we're replacing David. Uh, so uh, we could all talk about this for much longer than people probably want to listen to us for. Um, 
So we should probably do this just as a separate unrecorded thing because I, I don't know about you, but everyone I talk to about my job finds it incredibly boring, but I find it very interesting. <laughs> and I think you lot probably find it as interesting as I do. So we should probably just keep on talking about this off, off the camera, but I, I think we should probably wrap it up in five minutes. Before we do wrap it up, um, uh, Mike, because he's an, basically an excellent uh, panel moderator, set Steve up for a great question, um, which I want to pick him up on. So, and sort of extend a little bit. So obviously from the world of data, we, we have always, you know, until for the last few decades lived in a third party world where there was an independent measurement and everything was built around that independent measurement and it was a common currency. And, and what, you know, Facebook and the other platforms brought in was this concept of like, listen, if your first party data is good enough, I'll buy off that data too, which was kind of hitherto, you, you couldn't do that. You had to sell off an independent thing. And, and TV now has a lot more opportunities to do a similar thing, such as the, the examples that Mike gave. But how, how do we balance those two things? And bearing in mind, you know, Emma's got to see across the whole point of view. She doesn't want to just see numbers from a particular vendor. She has to see numbers that make sense for all of her clients. How do we balance the kind of comparability that third party data provides and the sort of independence that it has with the sort of type of deeper insights and, and you know, movements into attribution specific attribution that first party data brings how, how do you do all that from a political and a data point of view yeah well i think that's that's a pretty big question i think i think the um yeah a few points that i would make against it rather than seeking to try and you know, pretend i can answer that yeah I mean, solve first, it, steve <laughs> first, yeah, first, i would i would counsel people that it isn't the choice between first and third party data in my opinion i think it's both right i think there's real strengths in both the data those, those types of data um, and I what we tend to see actually is that it's really horses for courses um, I think really one of the things that does worry me a little bit I have spoken to people in the TV industry are saying yeah we have a first party data that scares me a bit for me I think it is about both and, and that's really important and I think there's also you know, something in the middle, which for that reason, we tend to call second party data, but I think is really interesting. It's very similar to what Mike talked about in terms of, you know, how we use, you know, data that the kind somebody like a Kroger would have to measure advertising for somebody like Unilever. You know, that's something we're already seeing in the market. So we're actually doing that in the UK with a large broadcaster and a large grocer, you know, helping them to measure CPG advertising. And I think that that kind of thing also becomes, you know, really interesting. So. Yeah, for me, I think there's there's a piece about currency, which I think, you know, will change over time, although I think it will take quite a long time. And I, th I actually think people like probably Sky actually have the most interesting data asset um, to create a, a new currency, um, which I then think will get quite political about you know, using that. But I think to me, the the piece that I would, I started the call with, that I would come back to is you know the real unlock is to get back to business outcomes. I actually think that's the bigger, the bigger win here. Um, you know, is to be able to close that loop back to business outcomes. That is what people like Facebook and Google have done so well. Yeah, and they do it with us at LiveRamp. So I see it, you know, day in day out, and which we're not seeing huge amounts of, yeah, you know, in the TV industry is that ability to kind of say, you know. To my point, this isn't just about building your brand. This can actually have a direct impact on sales, and we can prove it. That is very common in you know, some of the platforms that I think TV is competing with, and is not yet very common in the TV industry. And to me, that's the that's the next stage that we have to get to. And and really, the outcome becomes the currency rather than you know who the impression was served to. You are the best panel I've. I've uh interacted with all day because you just keep segueing everything without <laughs> meaning to so i think i think that that would be a great place to this kind of area is a great place to, i'm going to ask you all to end on which is so steve basically laid out if i understand you correctly essentially what one thing you think we should concentrate on going forward and there, there was a lot of things that we could have talked about i think your, your point about sort of this is essentially a human industry change management process is is, is bang on and exactly right and everyone's brought up really good points but i i really like to think about um, and Steve, I think you've delivered yours so you're off the hook. But Mike, Emma, and, and Sarah, just think about <laughs> one. What one thing would you like to see happen? And and um, I'm going to start with Mike. Uh, the one thing I think is is education. Lots of this happens at the coalface with uh, young traders um, 
in media agencies and changing the status quo and their perceptions of what platforms can do, what television can do, uh, etc. And, and giving a really good understanding of how they can all work together and what their separate strengths are and how best to to actually make that happen for their clients. That would be the biggest thing for me. Excellent. Thank you. Sarah. Uh, so I guess from a Sky perspective, we're kind of on the road. You know, we, we've got loads of great stuff and we're doing lots of innovation. We've got, um, you know, kind of end to end me measurement solutions, a really great tech platform. Um, and, and what we really need is support. Uh, you know, we need support from the wider industry, from the agency world, from our clients, um, you know, just, just to continue to, to kind of push to get everybody else there as well. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of ready and we're in a really good position. But obviously, as everybody said here, um, it needs to be something that's adopted industry wide. And I don't think it is yet. So for outcomes, education and support, and Emma, since you, since you typically represent the support in financial terms, I thought I'd end with... <laughs> um, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push this back and say, I, I guess um, I, I want, would want to see the collaboration of, of the broadcasters. And, and actually, I'm just on that note, would like to say that, you know, I think the whole industry has already seen much better collaboration. Certainly, if I look back to kind of 20 years ago when I first started out in as a TV buyer, I, I mean, there was zero collaboration. Um, and I um, was fortunate enough to, to chair a panel last week where I had ITV, Channel 4 and Sky together um, talking about some of the issues um, that we're, we're, we're faced with. And, and I suppose from my perspective, it's the continued collaboration um, for the greater good of TV, because as, as we've already discussed, um, we know it works. We're, we're getting better at um, demonstrating outcomes. Um, and I think just to that point, we need to make sure that we don't just look at short term outcomes. We look at long term outcomes because that is uh, because TV can deliver against both. Um, but we're only ever really going to get there if we, if we collaborate. And that's not just the broadcasters that need to collaborate. It's agencies, it's clients and, and the broadcasters together that need to collaborate. Because if we're going to make something like one campaign work, you know, we all need to be in it to, together. And so collaboration would be my one thing. I can't believe we ended up without mentioning COVID other than we're all in this together. <laughs> it's like possibly the only positive message that's come out of this whole thing is we're all in this together. So Emma, you nailed it. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you so much, everyone. And and um, I hope you enjoyed that. I, I could have carried on talking with you lot for ages because it's 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 a rare treat to be in a virtual room with um, so many smart people with, with so uh, such excellent opinions on stuff. So thank you very much for your participation across the across the world. And uh, with that, I'll say goodbye and hopefully we'll see you again at some other point. Thanks, Thanks David. Thanks, nice David. to meet Bye. you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.